Our next speakers are Greg Strang and Peter Tuddenham. And well, it takes some time to introduce them, but I will try to keep it short. Greg is the Associate Director of the Lawrence Hall of Science at the University of California. He is the founding director of Marine Activities, Resources and Education, the director of the Center for Ocean Science Education Excellence in California, and the current president of the USA uh, National Marine Educators Association. Peter is the chairman of the International Committee of the National uh, Marine Educators Association of the US, executive director of the College of Exploration, so it's a great honor to have both of you here, and the floor is yours. Good morning. So I'm going to talk about the process, or the process, of how we came up with ocean literacy. I guess it's process in England, and it's process in the United States. So I'm going to talk about the processes, or processes and principles, of how we came up with the ocean literacy definition, concepts, and, uh, um, and then you, know, you can give it some thought for how ocean literacy in Europe might proceed. So our goal, as Craig so elegantly and, and wonderfully described, was to get ocean content into the existing curriculum. We're not trying to add more to teachers' work. We're trying to, as I love the term, Jan said, marinate the curriculum which is to use the existing curriculum to enhance and insert ocean content, to influence national standards, and to engage everyone who has a stake or a role in ocean science and education in the process. I can see I'm going to be processing and processing. So what's interesting about this to me is that the, the process of coming up with the brochure started thanks to the National Geographic, talking with a brochure on World Literacy for Geography, which is their mission. So they produced this nice little brochure. Then um, I got to work with the predecessor to the next speaker, Francesca Carver, who was at uh, National Geographic, who said, we want to get oceans into geography. So here's oceans into geography brochure. And so we got scientists and educators together. And so then I met Craig, and we started talking about how do we get a process together to come up with ocean literacy when we don't have any money, we don't have any large organization that's saying, you know, let's do it. We were a collective, if you like. And so we said, well, we'll do something like the National Geographic process that we did. And we came up with this. And this is a very interesting icon and symbol. And I've seen teachers stand up in front of audiences like this and say, look, everybody, this is what I worked on. You know, this is what we believe. And it is a totem, if you will, of that belief. So we started um, by going to the top, and Francesca Carver here in the picture um, recorded video. And I'm getting more and more, uh, you know, video has to be part of the solution. Uh, let, um, Mr. Panetta, up in the top left there, he was at the time chairman of the Pew Oceans Commission. He's now di uh, director of, uh, um, of defense. Uh, Admiral uh, Lukensbecker was the um, administrator for NOAA. Uh, Admiral Watson was the head of um, CORE at the time, an ocean uh, leadership group of universities. Uh, Gil Grosvenor was chairman of National Geographic. Uh, Marsha McNutt uh, from the Aquarium in the Pacific uh, region. And Sylvia Earle and Bob Ballard. And they were all asked the question, what is ocean literacy? Why is it important? And so we got some really important uh, leaders in ocean topics talking about it on video. So we started off by, first of all, acknowledging all similar work. Uh, this was very important to bring and build that community. So I'd encourage you to you know, look, as you have been doing and are doing, to involve everything that has been done so far and start to make it relevant. We started, too, from the very outset, and thank you to um, Waleed Saab for talking about the internet generation. We use technology from the very outset and to save money, to involve as many people as possible, uh, and to record all actions transparency. We used a variety of technological uh, features and, and, and so on. Online surveys, maps. I'm a big believer in mapping. And I think that's particularly important in a European context where language is such a challenge, although I understand 
that language is becoming less of a challenge in the sense that more people are speaking English, but the problem with that is that more people are speaking English. And so the concepts of ocean literacy may be an English concept and not necessarily a Portuguese concept. And that is why you'll hear from Margarita in a moment about how the concept of ocean literacy in Portuguese has a, a different, different meaning. So meaning structures and language are crucial. We use small groups, large groups, whatever groups we could get together. And here's just a representation uh, of us working uh, on the scope and sequence work that Craig said, uh, the small committee meeting of the Ocean Literacy Committee of the National Marine Educators Association. Uh, Craig and Catherine and Tina and Lynn, some of our colleagues uh, in uh, California working together. So the first Ocean Literacy Conference was actually for the National uh, to do this work to get oceans into geography. And we used an online system of discussion that the College of Exploration hosts. And it gave an ability to do it quickly, to do it and record it in text that was uh, easily readable. Uh, and so um, that was the first one that was done in 2002. And then we moved on to the work that um, we did with Ocean Literacy in 2004. So we've gone from that textual base to now um, online seminars with multiple video streams. And here's an example of one that we did recently with five of us on video from our respective offices, um, all coming together to talk about ocean literacy, where it's going using the latest technology. Here's an example of a mind map that I put together from the very outset. You don't need to look at the details. It's all online off the website. But the idea was to show everyone involved that we had absorbed their work and had it related in a sense. And this is an example of a map of scope and sequence that has been developed, which shows a progression of learning uh, um, aspects. Here's a map of where you're all from. I thought you might like to see where you're all from. And here's a map of the attendees of this conference, just to get a sense of who's turned up. And there's a few gaps, and you can see them. You know, there's obviously gaps from Spain and the south of France. and. I mean, Albert is representing Germany here, but I, you know, I think there's... Uh, so anyway, the idea here is that you know, Europe is a large place <laughs> with multiple languages, with multiple challenges, and uh, how do you build an inclusive uh, conversation around a topic of ocean literacy? Now, that is the question. So a, a little summary of the process. We use organizational and individual development theories and practice. We use multiple modes of different technologies, media, print, video, and so on. Um, we use technologies for recording, displaying, and mapping. Uh, we want to leverage, or English, what is English? Leverage. Uh, leverage, lever existing organizations and knowledge. Uh, and the, the key thing, which I think Wally perhaps touched on, is develop shared language. Now people talk about ocean literacy. You have begun to, to talk about ocean literacy. It is a mental construct around an idea and the language of only one ocean, as Craig pointed out. Every time you see the word oceans, you could think that they are separate entities, but the word ocean emphasizes there is only one ocean. So, um, and it's, it's somewhat of a continuous and semi-chaotic and complex and messy process. Here is sort of a list of things that I would encourage you to think about. Total openness, uh, as much inclusion as possible. Be as flexible as possible. Collaborative, absolutely. Take systems approaches, think in systems terms and interdependencies. We have to be sustainable over time with limited funding. We've had some redundancies. We've developed a community of practice. And a key point, this issue of shared ownership. No one owns this, but everyone owns it. And if you can develop that sense, then everybody will be the spokesman for it. And as Craig pointed out, you have to be attentive to be scientifically accurate. We, unfortunately, have been, well, I've been personally upset to see a document that came out that was so, the first generation of the next generation of the science standards to be so terrestrially biased. So without sort of going on about that, but you have to be so attentive to this. And it has to be applicable locally and nationally and used by 
you know, schools, aquariums, not-for-profits, and so on. And as Craig said, it was used by um, government agencies. How, how to do this, change the system? Well, we talked about top-down, bottom-up, sideways in, and networked is sort of the way I like to think of it. So you've got to have all of those to change the system as you wish to define it. What are the challenges? Well, as we've heard, the ocean is removed from many people's consciousness. It's a long way off. Um, how do we make that connection? I was thinking about that as I was going around on the half-hour boat tour. How do you make a connection to the water around Bruges, to the ocean, for maybe students in, even in Bruges, probably? Um, water flows and systems affect everyone and use local language and relevancies. And I think the problem is, is that, you know, 150 years ago, we were all connected deeply to nature because we had to go to the well to get water. But now we just turn on a tap, we all live in cities, people are removed from a direct connection to nature. So our sensibilities have changed, and it's getting worse. So what are we doing now for the future? Well, we're obviously networking, we're thrilled to be here, and again, you know, congratulations to the team for pulling it all together. Um, we've got a website, um, everybody can contribute to it. We have a Facebook page, we've got a Twitter, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Pinterest, we've got a YouTube channel, and we've got Google+. And if I've missed something out, you must let me know. We're trying to be as pervasive and ubiquitous as possible. The next step is to develop digital assets. There are se over 700 little bubbles in those scope and sequence charts. Each one is a learning opportunity, and we want to develop digital assets that are linked to those concepts, to the principles. So teachers, students, scientists, anybody can go in and do it. Find, find little short video clips, lesson plans, supporting documents. And we're doing what we can to support, you know, the initiative in, in Europe here, uh, one in South America, uh, in Chile, the conference it meant Chile, uh, on, on, on oceans in Chile in November, and there's been initiatives in, in other parts of the world. So yes, a global ocean literacy and ocean science taught in every school, that should be the goal, right? Around the globe, every student should know about the ocean and understand its role in their lives of, of them and their planet.